Welcome! In this video, we'll be covering a blueprint for data analysis. We'll be reviewing some very basic methods to analyze qualitative data. So let's get started. Remember that all the material cited comes from Kruger and Casey's 2015 book entitled Focus Groups, A Practical Guide for Applied Research through Sage Publishers. So let's first talk about what analysis is or what analysis must be. First of all, analysis must be purpose-driven. Remember what your research question is and always come back to that research question as you're beginning the analysis process. Likewise, analysis must be systematic. At the very beginning, you must have a very clear plan on how you're going to tackle the analysis process. The clearer you can be, the more prepared you are to execute your plan, the more successful your analysis will be. Always remember that analysis must be verifiable. We talk about this quite a bit in qualitative classes, but it's important to remember that the, the time that you put in to think about your verifiable techniques, your sense of trustworthiness, helps again in the end, in the end result with an analysis that's verifiable, trustworthy, and credible. Likewise, analysis must be sequential and continuous. Analysis is something that you need to think about even before you collect data, all the way through data collection and into the analysis process and even afterwards. So let's get started by talking about things to consider before you even collect data in regards to the analysis process that you'll follow. So first it's important to look over all of your questions, your interview questions, and think specifically about your analysis, both your interview questions and your research questions, and thinking about the analysis before you even begin. As you enter into interviews or focus group interviews, you need to anticipate the discussion. Think about using multiple strategies for data capture, whether it is uh, data for interviews, observations, as well as how you're going to collect and, and strategize capturing that data. Make sure in a focus group especially that you're going to be working with the note taker to ensure that the right data is captured. This is vitally important to make sure that you're not missing out on important data because your note taker wasn't prepared. Likewise, during a focus group, you need to be aware of certain um, important elements. First is identifying the situation requiring further exploration. So as your focus group members or any of your interviewees may be discussing and talking, you want to think about areas that you are specifically going to want to probe and follow up with further exploration questions. If there's language that's questionable in the sense of, of you not quite understanding what that's meant, you need to follow up by asking specific follow-up questions. This again helps you clarify when you're in the data process, the data analysis process. Ending questions that identify the most important topic. Also, ending summary and asking for verification. The more time that you put into the analysis process ahead of time, especially as you're collecting the data, the more successful your analysis will be. There's nothing worse than beginning analysis or getting into analysis and realizing that you should have asked a certain question and you missed the opportunity to ask that question. So again, working ahead of time and thinking about this before you, data, you collect your data is essential. Okay, going back to considering what we're going to need to think about even before we collect our data. Consider again in the focus groups how you will debrief after a focus group interview or even after multiple individual interviews, especially if you're working with a team. You'll always have to consider how you're going to file, how you're going to copy, and how you're going to document all the different techniques that you're using to collect your data. How will you transcribe? Consider what it's a coding process that you'll use, and we'll talk a little bit about that in later videos. We'll talk about a basic strategy for pattern recognition for this video. Consider how you'll prioritize the analytic themes, especially going back to your research question. And likewise, what format for writing up the final report will you be using? Okay, again, this video is going to be covering a very basic structure of thematic analysis, which is useful for most any type of qualitative data that you have. But again, remember, this is a very basic structure. So this will help you get started, but in terms of more complex analysis, you'll need to push yourself further. So let's first remember that we start with the very first question to analyze. And we're going to assume in this video that you've already collected some focus group data. So if you've already had several focus group interviews and you've compiled that data in a way that you're ready to analyze it. So we'll begin with this walking through is thinking about the very first question that you're ready to analyze. 
Always keep in mind as you attack the analysis process that you're constantly comparing and making decisions throughout the process. So I always ask myself, is this similar or is this different when I'm looking at each of the questions as I'm beginning my analysis? Okay, again, very basically, there's a four-step process that you follow when you're doing a basic qualitative analysis, and we're going to use this as an example in a focus group. Again, this is very simplistic, but it helps show you how important it is to be systematic and to be structured and to have an idea ahead of time before you start the analysis process. So we're going to follow through step one, two, three, and four. So very basically, we start with the first question that was asked. So let's pretend you've asked three questions in a focus group or four questions, and you collect that data by question. So as you have compiled all of your data from your first question, you'll look through all the different responses to that first question. You'll pick up a, a particular response and you'll ask yourself, okay, did this participant answer the question that was asked? Pretty simple. So if, they, you, if you read the comment that your participant made and you think, yeah, they answered my question, then you will automatically skip to number three. What if they didn't answer your question? Okay, good point. So if you, they didn't actually answer the question that you ask, you'll need to take that information, the comment in front of you, and now skip to question two. Ask yourself, does the comment answer another question that was asked? Okay, so if, they, if it does answer another question that was asked, maybe they jumped ahead and they, and they answered a question that you were gonna be asking down the road. That's very simple. Take that comment and then just move it to the question that it relates to. Now, if they didn't answer that question, take that comment and put it into a discard pile. The discard pile is a place right now where you're putting information that you don't think fits at this moment. It's always important to go back to your discard pile and take a look at the comments that you have to see if you've missed anything or if it's important that through this discard pile something did get missed. But at this point, we're going to create a discard pile that means that the participant didn't answer any of the questions, directly answer any of the questions that were asked. So. Now we'll move on to, set, uh, to step three. You still have that same comment, and now you're looking at it and you ask yourself, does that comment say something of importance about the topic? So does it relate to your topic and specifically also into, in terms of your research question? Okay, so if it does relate, then you place it under the appropriate question. No, again, then it goes into a discard pile. Then with step four, you have to ask yourself, is it like something that has been said earlier? And this is where we get back to the constant comparison and contrasting, thinking about similarities and differences. So if you've noticed you're on, you, you've moved on to maybe your third or fourth comment under your first question, you begin to see that, well, that sounds like a lot of so, uh, what somebody else said. And you begin to start grouping those quotes together. Now, when you ask yourself, is this like something that's been said earlier and your, and your response is no, then that may mean that you're starting a separate grouping. Okay, we've covered basically four pretty simple steps to a classic analysis strategy, and we're assuming that you've got some focus group information, some fo focus group data that you want to use. So let me show you an example. Okay, let's pretend that we've had seven participants and you see seven clusters of answers. And each one of those, we had a focus group, and with our seven participants, we asked them three questions. Question one was, what's your favorite thing to eat at the movies? Question two was, where's your favorite place to sit at the movies? And question three, what is your least favorite thing about going to the movie theater? Obviously, this wasn't a full focus group interview, but let's just, for the sake of doing some analysis, pretend that it was. And what I did was, I transcribed my interview, and then I grouped the comments based on whether it was asked by question one, or, asked, or, or whether it, it answered question one, whether it answered question two or whether it answered question three. So the first one, two, and three that you see at your page that starts off with when I go to the movies, that was one person's response to question one and two and three. So take a minute, press pause, and I'd like for you to read through each one of these. Take your time because this will help you as we move into the analysis process. Okay, now that you've had a chance to read all of them very carefully, we're going to basically walk through steps one through four. Okay, we're going to start again, remember, with our very first question, which was, well, what is your favorite thing to eat the movies? If we take the very first question that we were asked that was asked in the focus group or in your interview, we ask our first step one question. Did the participant answer the question that was asked? 
Now, as we go down this list, starting with Goobers, Twizzlers, and M&Ms, we're going to ask that question. Did the participant answer the question that was asked? If we say yes, we're going to skip on to question three, and we're going to move that to another pile. If it's no, we'll go to question two. So as we go through, let's take a look. Did this person, by answering Goobers, Twizzlers, and M&Ms, answer the question? Yep, they did. Popcorn was so much better. My arteries clogged? Yep, they did. Got to be the popcorn. When I go to the movies, I love to eat popcorn. It's pricey, but what else would you eat? I try only to buy a small drink unless I want to take out a second mortgage. And movie popcorn tastes so much better at the movies, I buy the biggest tub. So all of those have been answered yes to our question, and we've moved them on to question three. Let's take a look at this last one. I really like pizza, pizza so I wish they served pizza at the movies. Well, that one doesn't exactly answer our question, correct? So this one goes into to number two. We want to move it to that question. Does it answer another question that we've asked? At this point, remembering the questions that were asked, it really doesn't answer another question. So at this point, we might move it to a discard pile. Okay, so now we're going to move on to step three and four, just to finish up the process, just with question one. So we've taken these that we've moved over to this side, and now we're going to ask ourselves, does the comment say something of importance about the topic? Well, yes, it does. And so now we're going to try to group them in a way that makes sense. Is it like something that has been said earlier? And I went ahead and did this for you in a way that hopefully shows you that there's a way to group them based on, the, on what they said and some similarities and differences. So for example, this group, they talked a lot about popcorn. This person focused mostly on candy. This person on what they drank. And again, the question is here, here's our discard pile. Is this really relevant is a good question to ask. Again, keep that relevant pile or that irrelevant pile, that discard pile, uh, until you're at the very end because you may find there might be something interesting there that you did overlook. So just in general, we see that we've gone from question one, step one, two, three, and four, and we've gotten together, we've organized them into some groups that make sense based on what they've said, based on some patterns that we've seen. Okay, now we're going to move on to question two. So this is the second question that we asked for our focus group or our interview, and I want you to take a moment, press pause, and please read through all the answers. And then I'm going to ask you to do what we just did, to step through, walk through step one, two, three, and four, and put these into groups based on some patterns that you potentially see happening. So press pause, take a moment, and read through all this data. Okay, now that you've done that, let's move on. So if you've done this, you may see that you had some that, that grouped together and some that may not have grouped together. So here's an example of how I might have grouped these after I determined whether or not they were relevant, and then I put them together into groups. This group, or this one, re references the front row in terms of the favorite place to sit. This group of data references liking to sit in the middle rows. This data represents the end of a row. And I did add this example. We have a duplicate. Up above it says, I hate the front, so I prefer either the middle or the back. Sometimes we have to take our data and say, well, it actually rep it references two different things, the middle row and the back row. And so sometimes we have to make some adjustments because the, that particular person actually referenced two different things. So we do have a reference to the back row here. Likewise, we, uh, we still have that category of what's relevant. And in, in this particular answer, I almost never go to the movies, I like to watch movies at home, doesn't really help us with our research. We again put it in that discard pile, hang on to it because we might find something interesting in there when we look back, but overall, it doesn't help us with our particular question. Okay, we're going to do this one more time with question three. So again, take a moment, read through question three, which was, what is your least favorite thing about going to the movie theater? And you'll notice that these are all, again, the responses from the, your participants. So again, take a moment and read through those carefully. After you've read through those carefully, again, follow steps one, two, three, and four, and see if you can place them into categories where you see some similarities and differences, and maybe something that was irrelevant. When you've done that, we'll move on. Okay, I've assumed that you've pressed pause and you've read through these carefully and you've already put them into some categories. So let's see what you got. Here's an example of how I organize them. What's your least favorite thing about going to the movie theater? 
For this group, it really deals with issues of cleanliness. Shoes sticking to the floor, uh, floors gross them out, or seats that make them feel icky because they can imagine um, having you know participants with, uh, with butterfingers all over their seats. So this group uh, talked a lot about cleanliness. There seemed to be a similarity there. This group of data talked about um, having to go to the bathroom but missing the movie. So when you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the movie, unfortunately you can't press pause, right? Like you do when you're at home. This particular data um, talked about the price of snacks, the cost uh, about going to the movie and that being one of their least favorite things. And likewise, we still have that kind of relevance category in terms of not being relevant to what we're capturing. I don't like movies. I don't want, like watching sad movies because they make me feel like crying. I don't want to cry in front of people. Okay, so overall you've had the chance to walk through the four-step process with three different questions and the data that aligned up with those questions. So that should have given you a really basic understanding of how the process works in terms of collecting your data, putting in, reading it, asking those, those, those simple questions, organizing it based on some similarity thing, similar things that you're seeing or differences that you're seeing, and then beginning to tease apart the data and to put it into organizing groups, which is basically looking for patterns. So as we begin to close up the data analysis video, some things to consider. Always know your environment in terms of the interview environment or the focus group environment. Thinking about how those questions relate to your topic, um, how your interview questions and your focus group are gonna get you at the best data possible, and how you're going to use that environment to get to the best data possible, whether it's an individual interview or whether it's a focus inter group interview, maybe it's document analysis, but knowing the best way to get the best data is really important. Remember that being there is best. So in any op opportunity that you have to do your own interviews and your own focus group interviews is ideal. Not being there removes you from the data and makes analysis much more difficult. Likewise, it's important to remember that not everything is worthy of analysis. So while you may have collected quite a bit of information, not everything is gonna be directly related to your research question. Sometimes people don't always answer the questions how you expect them and they get off topic. So keep in mind that everything that you see is not necessarily worthy of including in your analysis. The basic thing to take away from this video is that really much of your basic analysis strategies are based on pattern identification. So you're looking at the data and you're considering, again, similarities, differences, where do you see a pattern emerging? And then thinking about what that pattern might mean and then eventually thinking about the complexity within categories or across categories. But again, pattern identification is not always appropriate and there are other uh, myriad of ways of doing data analysis that may not always include some type of pattern, uh, uh, pattern identification. As we've mentioned in previous videos, it's always important to be aware of the personal bias that you bring and any pre-existing opinions that you have. We've talked before about uh, researcher reflexivity, so knowing about the biases that you may have and putting those, making those very explicit before you even start the analysis process. Always keep in mind that you are the voice of the participants. You need to keep in mind that you're gonna be taking their voice and bringing it forward, not your voice, this is not a research study on you. This is a research study on your participants. So you must take their voice and bring it to the forefront. I always recommend visually representing the findings in some way that is visually appealing. Whether it be a table, a chart, a graph, is always helpful when you have a lot of qualitative data and it's very text heavy to represent it visually for the reader. Always be cautious with the numbers. So always be cautious about it of saying, three out of four, four out of five, six out of seven, because it lends itself to becoming, thinking about um, how those numbers may have a particular type of bias already embedded with them. So always be cautious about actually using numbers um, with the data. The data should be, the voice and the, and the theme of the data should be, for, should be forwarded as opposed to exactly how many people said what. Likewise, also when you're collecting data, be careful about interpreting body language to mean something. So it's important to look for those elements of body language, but it's also very important not to spend too much time emphasizing body language because there may be things that you might be missing, especially with cultural cues and things like that, and things of that, of that nature. So it's very important to be careful when you're interpreting body language, thinking about how the body language that you're interpreting could be very culturally bound. 
Okay, so what we're going to do now is give you an opportunity to do something that we do, an activity that I often do in class. And that activity is to take a look at some images and attempt to find some patterns. So you're going to get be seeing two different screens. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to take a look at the images on these two different screens. And what I'll ask you to do is you can pause in between the two screens so you have a chance to, to uh, jot some notes. But what I'm going to be asking you you're going to see a lot of different pictures. I'd like for you to take a look at the pictures on this page. And again, I'll move to the next page and show you the pictures on that page. And as you're looking, you're more than welcome to press pause. But I'm going to be asking you how many different patterns or groupings can you do with the images that you see. So stop for a minute, take a look at this picture, press pause, take some notes, and then I'll show you the next image next of which you can press pause and also take notes. Hopefully you've pressed pause and you've had a chance to take some notes about the different images that you see in front of you. And now I'm going to move to the next page and you can always rewind the video and watch it again. But here is the next page and the next group of images. So again, please feel free to press pause, take some notes, and then start considering out of all your notes the pattern or the different ways that you might decide to group these images. Okay, now that you've pressed pause, hope we've been able to rewind the video, uh, spend some time taking notes. Let's think about the different ways that we might want to group these images. Let's assume that all of these images are examples of key or keys. So we might have key as a name. You could have organized it this way. Maybe you found a pattern such as keys that were metal. That's another way that we could have organized these pictures. Maybe you decided to organize your pictures based on keys that had buttons. It's another way to organize and to find patterns among the images. You could find images, you could have organized your images as keys with a keychain attached. Likewise, you could have organized these images as keys for a vehicle and also as keys that reference something. Maybe you decided that there are keys that actually get chewed on. Some of you might have been creative and said these were animated keys. Or notice that quite a few of these keys had a skull. So ultimately what I like what I hope to uh, attempt to have you understand with this very quick example there are multiple ways that you can take images just like there are multiple ways that you can take data and you can look at it for the patterns and those patterns oftentimes depend on your research question so your research question and what you're really interested in is what really drives that pattern identification but as you can see with just a handful of images there are multiple ways that we can look for patterns and multiple ways that we can group things but again that grouping of those patterns really depends depend on our actual research question that's involved. So hopefully this was a helpful video, um, gave you a really quick overview on data analysis to at least get you started on some very basic ways to look for patterns among your qualitative data.